My name is uh, Joseph Duraney and I'm one of the congenital cardiovascular surgeons at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And today we're going to talk a little bit about Epstein's anomaly. Epstein's anomaly is a, is a, is a congenital heart anomaly, one of the more rare uh, heart anomalies. And uh, it's a fascinating anomaly because every abnormality is different from patient to patient and you can have um, a range in the clinical spectrum from that of a symptomatic newborn that requires surgery urgently to an incidental finding found on an older adult in the 60s or 70s as part of a routine part of a physical examination and then of course every every possibility in between. Um, the problem revolves around two things. First, the underlying abnormality is that of the muscle of the right ventricle. The muscle of the right ventricle is abnormal. It is what we call a myopathy. And the, the valves inside the heart typically develop from the inner aspect of the muscle of the ventricle. So in the case of Epstein's anomaly, we have an abnormal right ventricle Typically, the right ventricle is very thin, it's very dilated, and the function of it is, 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 is usually quite reduced. And then you have a tricuspid valve, which is markedly abnormal. And the major problem with the valve is usually leakage. And so we have the combination of an enlarged, usually poorly functioning right ventricle in the setting of a tricuspid valve that, that is anatomically very abnormal and oftentimes leaks a lot. Now, this is usually well tolerated in young patients and uh, it's very, very common to be having a conversation with the parents of a child saying, I, I don't understand how anything can be wrong. I mean, my, my child has been running around and going to school and even playing maybe various competitive sporting activities and apparently doing just fine, only to be told that uh, there is uh, a problem with, uh, with a valve that's leaking severely and the, the subject of consideration for surgery comes up, which actually can be quite alarming. Uh, conversely, um, with the advances in prenatal ultrasounds, this is a diagnosis that uh, oftentimes is diagnosed um, um, prenatally, and so uh, there may be a known um, presence of Epstein's anomaly at the time of birth. But the presence of it does not necessarily mean that something needs to be done. Um, this is a diagnosis where the, the, the timing of operation um, can be quite variable. I mean, patients can tolerate this leaky valve and this enlarged right ventricle for years and sometimes decades before anything needs to be done. And then there are other circumstances where surgery is going to um, be offered earlier either because a child is not getting along well or a young or uh, older adult is not getting along well. They may start to have symptoms of heart failure. Uh, in the case of a child, there may be failure to grow. Uh, there's oftentimes a concomitant hole in the heart, and when there's a hole in the heart, then cyanosis or blueness may be present, and that may uh, trigger the um, need to um, offer um, operation um, sooner. Now. The, the Mayo Clinic has actually had a long-standing interest in Epstein's anomaly. We, the first operation for Epstein's anomaly was done here by one of my mentors, Dr. Gordon Danielson, back in 1972. And uh, he became very interested in this anomaly. Um, and over the course of the last 30-plus uh, uh, years, we now have gained a surgical experience that exceeds 800 operations. And if we include patients that are being followed in the uh, medical um, um, clinic by the congenital heart, um, uh, by the cardiologists, um, there are in fact um, um, a couple thousand patients that are being followed either post-operatively or, um, or prior to um, the need for surgery. So um, we've gathered uh, a, a, a relatively extensive experience uh, with this anomaly, which I believe is particularly important just because every patient is different and the inside of every heart is a little bit different. No two hearts are the same. And so what you do at the time of surgery is going to be a little different from patient to patient. And many uh, surgeons will never really accumulate a regular experience uh, with, this, with this specific diagnosis. And so it does make sense to seek out consultation and evaluation 
I'm at a center where there's going to be a, a, a more comprehensive um, experience, both um, from the medical side as well as the surgical side. Now, this is one of the one of the interesting things about this diagnosis is that if you go to the literature, you will find that there are oodles and oodles of operations that have been designed to treat this anomaly. Surgeons from all over the world have sort of um, contributed um, their little spin about what they think would be the best way to fix um, these valves. And to me, it's really a reflection of discontent with all of the procedures. I mean, it's just a it, it just indicates that we really have not found a perfect operation for this, this, um, this uh, um, congenital abnormality. Um, I do believe that there are some operations that are, are, are better uh, than others, um, but quite frankly there's always a, a little bit of, of, of one technique or a little bit of another technique that gets combined to address the specifics at the time of surgery. Now, I did spend some time um, learning from um, uh, a surgeon in Brazil who, in, in my opinion, I think has designed an operation that is the most anatomic. That is to say, it gets the valve and the ventricle back to as close to normal as possible, recognizing that it is not at all normal. Um, and this is an operation called the cone technique. And um, I have um, used uh, um, um, a lot of this technique with um, many of the um, more current operations that we've done and have continued to incorporate techniques that I've learned from my mentor, Dr. Danielson. And um, as, as mentioned earlier, I mean, there's often a little bit of this and a little bit of that that gets applied to um, a given operation um, with the ultimate goal being that of repairing the tricuspid valve. Um, that is the major um, premise here, is an operation that is designed to preserve the patient's own valve and it's not always easy to do. The valves are so abnormal that it oftentimes um, results in inability to get a satisfactory repair and in the event that that occurs then you are talking about replacing the tricuspid valve. Now the question comes up how long does it last? And to be fair there really is nothing that we do with this anomaly that is truly lifelong. The very best that we can hope for is a tricuspid valve repair that would provide years and decades of a good result. But the reality of it is, is that many of these patients, probably most of these patients, will come back at some point in time in the future for recurrent leakage of that valve. And um, what gets done at any subsequent operation would be determined by the findings at that time. Um, the results with surgery are very good. Um, we are in a situation now where the vast majority of these valves can uh, be repaired, um, particularly in the hands of experienced surgeons that are used to seeing this anomaly. Um, the chances of surviving operation um, is, is, is overwhelmingly um, on the patient's side. I mean, the mortality um, at the time of surgery in general is about 2%. Um, and uh, obviously there are some situations where, um, where it may be higher if the function of the ventricle is, is, is quite reduced. But for the most part, even in those situations, um, cardiac surgery has gotten really very safe um, even for this uh, more difficult anomaly. Um, the late results are also encouraging, although um, this is no different than any other anomaly and probably more so than all of the other anomalies, and that is post-operative surveillance. These patients need to be continually followed um, for the um, onset of irregular heartbeats, arrhythmias down the road, um, for recurrent tricuspid valve problems, for um, ventricular function abnormalities. Um, the patient will never be um, free of uh, physicians um, during the course of a lifetime. But when, when, when patients are followed carefully and appropriate um, echocardiograms and other diagnostic studies are being performed on some kind of a regular basis, then the timing of subsequent procedures and interventions usually um, enables results to um, continue to be quite good. The symptomatic newborn is the, is the one circumstance where surgery is, is often required urgently. 
Uh, usually the, the baby may be um, tied to a ventilator, may even be tied to more um, aggressive uh, methods of mechanical support. And so surgery needs to be done um, at the location where the baby's born um, and the ability to transfer and stuff becomes a, a, becomes a little more difficult. But that's the exception rather than the rule. The vast majority of patients, the overwhelming majority of patients, usually are stable. They may in fact have minimal to no obvious symptomatology. And so this does, this is one of the few diagnoses where the ability for the patients, the families, to gather information and make an informed decision about where they want to go to, to obtain um, uh, an evaluation and, and possible treatment. You do have that with this anomaly. It's, um, you can prepare, you can travel. This is probably one of the more important anomalies to really seek out experienced personnel that are used to dealing with it because this is, this is a hard diagnosis um, for the cardiologist and it's a particularly hard diagnosis for the surgeon. And so the, the, the importance of doing homework and trying to go to a center where they have a reasonable experience um, 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 at, their, at their fingertips is important. And this is a diagnosis where I think being very, very straightforward and clear and asking your surgeon how many of these procedures he or she has done is, is critical um, because the, the, the results uh, of, of operation um, in general are always dependent on the operator, but even a little more so with a diagnosis like this. This is an anomaly that requires, I think, experience both um, from the cardiologist as well um, as the surgeon. And with uh, appropriate experience, I think the results um, have been quite gratifying um, for patients, children, and their families, um, and have been, uh, and have been um, quite gratifying um, in the many, many years and decades uh, that follow operation. I hope this has been helpful. and. Um, and uh, good luck, and if uh, we can be helpful in any way, uh, please don't hesitate to uh, contact our institution.